This episode of the Golf Guru Show is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. As golfers, you know the game creates wear and tear on your body and mind. Enveed CBD products can organically rejuvenate you. They come in three varieties, relief, clarity, and relax. Relief CBD products help relieve pain. Clarity allows you to focus on those critical shots. And relaxed CBD products are for those anxious golf moments. Right now, I've got an incredible special for you. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the promo code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, and I am the Guru. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy out there during these strange times with the COVID-19. I am doing my best to bring you content that will stimulate your mind and keep you busy, as this is a great time for all of us to reflect and recharge until we can get back to work, hopefully soon. It has always been my mission when I started this project to interview the top golf instruction minds in the business and high performers in all fields of study, break them down, get them to share all their stories, best practices, and information that has made them great and successful. And hopefully I've delivered on that promise. Make sure you download this episode and hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows that will be coming your way. And don't be afraid to share it with your followers as that's the biggest compliment you can give me. This episode is a milestone of sorts as it's my 100th show, 100th episode, I can't believe it. I've purposely saved this spot for a very special person that's had such an important part of my life and career. Of course, I'm speaking about my mentor, Miss Dana Rader. Dana is a legend in the teaching game and needs no introduction, but I'll give you just a few highlights of her bio. She is a Golf Magazine Top 100 teacher, Top 50 Golf Digest instructor, She's owned and operated one of the most successful golf schools in the country, the Dana Raider Golf School, for many years, which is where I started teaching full-time. Dana has won so many awards, uh, such as the Charlotte Charlotte Businesswoman of the Year, uh, which most people don't realize. Uh, She's done so much for uh, her community and uh, really the Charlotte area over the years. Uh, She was also the president of the LPGA teaching and coaching division for some time. And she has paved the way for so many female instructors over the years and just been such a great role model for for all of us in the industry. She is now the director of instruction at Belfair Country Club in Hilton Head Island, which is really cool because now she's kind of come full circle back to her roots of being at a private club and teaching the members and still cranking out so many lessons. This was such a, an incredible conversation and uh, very emotional, actually, for me, and one that I will remember forever as I attempt to pay respect to some of the many things that Dana has taught me over the years as we reminisce about my 12 years with her and some fun stories that come up. Uh, but don't sleep on the awesome information and advice that she gives to all you instructors, young and experienced out there. And I'm sure if you followed me, you will hear so many of the things that I have been passing on to my staff and all of you out there, and you get to hear it from the source, my friend and mentor. So without further delay, let's get to my conversation with Miss Dana Rader. Enjoy. What not? It's like you can be as technical as you want. Just imagine me and you talking, teaching shop. shop. Yep. Right. And trying to help other coaches. And it, it's really geared a lot towards younger coaches. They've really been very supportive of the show and the the stuff that I've been sharing. So I'm so excited to finally have you on. And I, Absolutely. I, was, I'm honored. I, I have, well, I've purposely saved this one for you because this is my hundredth 
episode. <laughs> No way. Is it really? Yes. Well, yes. Oh, my gosh. And, and And I wanted, thank you, and I wanted you to be the one on, on the 100th show because you've oh, had wow. such a great influence in my life and in my career. And we're going to well, dig into you. that. So, but yeah, so wel- welcome to the show officially. I know, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty cool intro anyways. Yeah. I might even leave it, leave it in there, but um, we can, we can, uh, we can go in a lot of different directions today. And I've got tons of notes, but I feel like we know each other so well. This should be, this should be fun. There'll be a lot of reminiscing, I think. And I'm sure we will, we will, uh, we'll, we'll think of stories as we go along that probably, uh, either of us haven't remembered for a couple of years, <laughs> Yes, but, sure. I, but I want to start, I want to start with, with your backstory. Cause I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of people know, of uh, how you got to where, not just where you are today, but to the golf school scene. So where did you grow up and share that with the listeners of sort of how you got in the golf and then some of your influences that led you to, you know, opening up the golf school? You know, uh, I probably haven't shared this a whole lot. Um, I, I know I have in some of my speaking engagements, uh, Jason, but when I was like 10 years old, um, I grew up in Morganton, North Carolina, and there was two things you needed to know how to do in Morganton was swing a baseball bat or a golf club. And um, I, I had the great honor of uh, playing golf with Billy Joe Patton, who in 1954 almost won the Masters as an amateur. He was a Curtis Cup player, um, phenomenal player. And Joe Chavis, who was my teacher at Mimosa Hills in Morganton, uh, he uh, was very instrumental in teaching me the game of golf. And he really kind of transferred his love and passion of the game to his students and me being one of them. And so at at the age of of 11, I I saw uh, I wanted to do sports camps and I saw groups moving from, you know, five moving here, five moving over here to putting and five moving over here to swimming and chipping and full swing and basketball and volleyball. So I, I really had that vision at a very young age of, of groups. And as I evolved into uh, golf and tried to go to the LPGA Tour, in um, 1981, I found out really quick that uh, I could not beat Beth Daniels and Nancy Lopez. So <laughs> I came, I came home. With, <laughs> I came home with my tail tucked, and um, you know, uh, started work at Myers Park Country Club in Charlotte. And um, I'll never forget uh, one of the members there at Myers Park said to me, "You know, Danny, we just, you know, as a woman, we just don't know what to do with you." And I went, "Well, that's really nice," but he, you know, he was just he, he wanted he just didn't know what my future was as a woman mm-hmm. in in the sport because this was back in you know the early '80s. And I had the great fortune of um, being involved in Peggy Kirk Bell's Golf Aries in the late 80s. And that's what inspired me to start the Dana Rader Golf School in 1987. And so that's kind of how everything kind of transpired. It really was a dream. And, you know, when you tell young people, uh, you, your dreams really can come true if you hang mm-hmm. on to them. You, you don't have to map it out. Sometimes you just got to let it evolve. Yeah, so you're skipping a few steps there, I know, because okay. you, you went you went to you went to Mars Park to what Rain Tree? Yes, yes. Right. So yeah, I, and that's really where it started, right? That's that was what you considered your first golf yeah, school. Yeah, well Rain Tree, um I actually was at Rain Tree in in um eighty three to eighty uh eighty two to eighty four. And then I went to River Hills. That's right. Yeah. Then you went to Lake Wiley. Yeah. Yeah. And I was down there for about five years. And that was probably one of the hardest decisions I had to make because I loved it at River Hills. In fact, Mm -hmm. where I am at Belfair, remind me of the members at uh, River Hills. Uh, And I've come full circle back in the country club business. But I, 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 I just really, really loved the members at River Hills. And so in 1990, I won uh, LPGA National Teacher of the Year. And um, I went out on my own with $2,000 in the bank and, um, you know, decided that I would go to Rain Tree and, and be an independent contractor. And as a result, um, that, that really winning that award kind of sp- really sparked my career and, um mm-hmm. 
And, and so uh, I worked at Raintree from, uh, again, from 1990 to 1997 and um, ha- had a great uh, hard, it was hard work. I mean, I was teaching probably 20 lessons a day, half hour lessons a day, mm-hmm. um, you know, five, six, seven days a week. Um, and, and, I, and I loved it. I did get a little burned out by the time uh, 97 rolled around. But um the interesting thing was in 1996, I got a letter from, it was a, it was looked like an official letter from Goff Magazine. And I picked it up and I opened it up and I had been out of town for two weeks. And that letter had been sitting there for probably two or three weeks. And it said something about being on the top 100. And I thought, oh, they want me to nominate somebody. So I just kind of tossed it in the trash and threw a cup of coffee on it and walked on into the, down the hallway. And you know how, when something just resonates, it goes, Oh my gosh, I think that it said <laughs> I'm nominated. <laughs> so oh I, go my back, gosh. I go back and I pull all the coffee grinds off of the dang letter. And sure enough, uh, the deadline was uh, the next day. So I got it FedExed and got it sent, sent to them in my bio and everything. And that's when I got uh, in, into the first, um, uh, uh, top 100. So it was uh, a great That's a bit, start. That was a big deal, right? Yeah. That was a big deal. Probably gave you a lot of credibility and. Yes. And then yes. How, when, when did you, when did you first have the idea that, Hey, I want to go bigger, like a golf school. That's a big project. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> and you probably look back on it now and go, <laughs> what the heck was I thinking? But yeah, you know, I go back you know to what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> Did you have, was it, was it a napkin? Was it a napkin yes, situation where you're yeah. having a drink going? <laughs> I, I was, I was, you know, I, uh, I sat down, um, you know, when I was at river Hills before I left to rain tree, this lady walks into the pro shop and she said, you know, Dana, and this was in 1987. She said, I think you are to have your own golf school and call it the Dana Raider golf school. And I went, Oh wow. I like that name. Okay. I think I can do that. And I went, I went home and I started writing schedules down. I started writing things down. Uh, you know, what would I do the groups? And, and, and so I laid out a business plan. And um, so I started doing golf schools, you know, down at River Hills. And then I, I knew it got so big at River Hills, I couldn't contain it uh, because people were coming from Charlotte there. And that's about a 25 minute ride. And I thought, you know, right. I need to be in the city. And when I got to Rain Tree, I, I really the, the school took off, and um, I'll never forget this. This these are these moments that we all have in life that are are so fortuitous, that are so unbelievable. Um, I was out at Pebble Beach, and it was the uh, first Women in Golf Summit, and there was the USGA, PGA, um, LPGA. All of all of the uh, golf networks were out there hosting this big, big deal. And so we were playing Pebble Beach and um, it was one pro and four ladies. And so uh, we get to the first tee and this this lady, uh, I can tell she's a beginner and she stepped up the tee. She couldn't hold the club. She was shaking. So I went, oh, my God, I'm going to have to help her. And I helped her all the way around the golf course. And she had a blast. I didn't get to play very good golf because I had to take care of her. But I thought, you know, that's my job. And, you know, this is a women in golf summit. So I need to make sure she has a great experience here, especially at Pebble Beach. And something I've always wanted to do was to write an article to be published. I I knew that to to really build my brand back then was to be published in a magazine, to be a writer. And um she thanked me and she, at the time, uh, worked for the Dallas Morning News. And um, two weeks later, she called me and she was named editor in chief of Golf Women Magazine and asked me to. I, I wrote lots and lots of articles. Yeah, you did. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, life kind of weaves you into things whenever you, you know, have that intention of what you want to do. It just kind of goes out there before you. And you just kind of run into things, not luckily, but but I think um, uh, your intention brings that to you. Absolutely. So it, it's interesting, you know, I, I, as you would know me very well, yeah. I like to be very <laughs> researched and uh-huh. prepared. And this one, it, it was easy 
to, to get ready for because I know you so well and I have so many questions. But I thought, why don't I just make a list of the things that I took away as it working for you, okay. you know, and we can discuss them. And, and it would be things that you've passed on to everybody that's worked for you, obviously. Mm-hmm. And we can have some good talking points and then we can go, you know, in a lot of different directions here. But it just it was a great it was a great exercise for me to reflect on everything that I've learned from you. And there's so much more. I, I, I started I started as like, okay, what's my top five? And then it became like 10, 15, <laughs> 20. <laughs> well, so I'm like, me, oh my God. Let me, just, let me just say this. I learned a heck of a lot from you too. So it, well, it, you know, the road goes both ways. So it's it's funny and we can kind of lead into this, but just, you know, the, the fact that you, and I tell this story all the time, your ears have had to be burning a lot in the last <laughs> couple of years uh, as I've done this show. Uh, talking about you and and you know being my mentor and giving a you know a, a backward redneck kid from West Virginia a chance, um, so I can't thank you enough for that. But uh, it, it there's a lot of moments that we could talk about, but I want to sort of start off with something you just said, and it made me think about it a lot as I was talking to Chuck Cook last night. He was on the show and he was talking about how teaching groups because he started out with the Golf Digest schools how teaching groups has really helped him in his career. Right. And I never really thought about how important it is to learn how to teach multiple people at one time. Mm. So that was the first thing is, is how, how to teach golf schools, group lessons, dealing with different personalities, you know, and then what you mentioned, how to build a schedule, Mm -hmm. you know, the organization piece was huge for me and I hated it. Like I I remember (laughs) when you're lead instructor for a golf school, you're like, Oh my God, now I got to put the (laughs) schedule together. Who's going to teach you? You put all the students together, but looking back, it was such a valuable lesson uh, Mm -hmm. for me that I've applied to to so many other um, parts of my career now that I'm the boss. Um, Talk a little bit about that and how that's, helped you. I mean, we can go into a lot of different technical, I guess, ideas of like how you teach groups, but you were one of the best at like managing a group of people. I mean, I always tell people, I'm, I was, I was trained by you to teach like six to eight people at one time, whether it's a corporate <laughs> event, you know, or, you know, keeping an eye on somebody and barking at somebody else and Hey, great job, Martha, you know? And so, so what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you feel like that's really helped you as you, oh. as you're Probably uh, lower lower scale now, right? You know, you're doing absolutely. what I'm doing, mostly one on ones. Yeah, well, I'm still doing a lot of groups. Um, you know, are you doing I, more groups? I, okay. Oh, yeah. I, well, I still do uh, basically groups in because I still love my groups. Sure. I think I think groups takes you away from technology. Uh, and then back then, Jason, there wasn't a lot of technology. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it makes your eye sharper. I think it makes your attention to detail. It makes you get them on tasks quickly. So if you've got a group of five or six, you've got to, you've got to walk up and down that, uh, line and you've got to determine where you're going to start with each one. And you've got to, within the first five minutes of them hitting golf balls, you've got to get all five or all six or all four on task doing something immediately. Because Mm -hmm. the worst thing is that you start up here with number one and, you know, you got somebody down here on the end at number five. And so I would go from one to five and then, you know, two to two to four. And I would I would really work it so that um, it, it, it. it organized me as a, as a teacher, it organized me to make Mm -hmm. sure that I'm focused on the essential things to get them started. Um, So grip, posture, alignment, whatever those essential things are from the beginning and then swing shape and then help them uh, if they're, if they're slicing the ball, help them bring the ball a little bit more left and start learning how to curve the ball in the other direction so that, that they have a sense of their ball flight is changing. They're getting their money's worth and obviously we're making them better. Yeah. It's easy to get sucked into spending time with the most needy is what I've found, you know, and we do some groups at at Carmel as well, but um, my young guys are, they're like, okay, I got this many people. And I'm like, all right, we got to take how much time you have, divide that into how many, like you got to know you've only got eight minutes with this person for a for, for an hour clinic or whatever. And like, God, I've never thought of it that way. I'm like, that's the way you train me because you've got to sort of divide you really your time. Organize, you really got to organize your time and you really got to organize yeah. your thoughts and where you're going to go with each person. And I think yeah. that's, you know, teaching groups really gets you, get your eye sharp and really get, makes you nail down to get the exact things 
that are the most important things to work on first. Yeah, for sure. The second thing that, that, that I wrote down was more in the group setting. And if something that you really helped me with was how to structure a private lesson, the pro, you know, I, I came in, I had no clue. I mean, where to start, you know, the, yeah. the interview process and the analysis, and that's something that we worked on a lot in our training. And I think the LPJ model was a yes. big, big help in that, in that realm. Um, talk about has your, has your, has your lesson structure changed over the years or do you feel like you sort of stick with the same sort of program and what, what is that? Give us a, a brief description you, you, of how you, you know, detail that. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, w- I would say my, my structure is basically the same um, because it's, a, it's such a good model. Um, you know, interviewing the student and finding out what their goals are, uh, finding out, you know, um, what their physical limitations are, and then really structuring it from a from a program standpoint. Because you know, I want my my students to know, let's do this together. Um, we're a team. You know, I work. I'm going to work hard. I want you to work hard. And um, building building that structure is very important to giving them drills, giving them a practice plan, giving them follow up, giving them the review of what you did, telling them what you what you did and telling them what mm-hmm. you want to to continue to do. So I, I think the LPGA model really made me a very good teacher in terms of keeping me organized. There's sure. a lot of newer teachers who've got a lot of really good information. They just don't know how to organize it and present it in a way that the student understands it. And a, and a student really doesn't want to know how much you know. They really want you to take care of them. And, and to the words of David Ledbetter, make them better faster. You know, that's right. it's, it, and, that's, and I think that's where we what we need to focus on is how do we get them better faster? Mm hmm. Yeah. One of the things, this isn't on my list, but this is something that, again, that I took away from spending the time with you that I did is I talk a lot about separating the IQ versus the EQ, right? So the IQ being the information, because, you know, like I said, when we were coming up, it was all about reading books and, you know, the internet wasn't even, even going full speed like it is now. The information's coming so fast. Right. So we had to get after it a little bit more to get the information. But in my opinion, the EQ is more more important. The emotional intelligence, the the reading the body language, understanding the personalities, you know, the bedside manner, which I think you had uh, the best I've ever seen, especially with groups where you you really encourage people and make them feel good about yes. you know playing golf. Is that something that you think you developed over over time, or you th- do you think the question I always ask is, can that be taught to some young coaches out there? Absolutely. I think that's what's missing nowadays. Absolutely. Because I learned that being a teacher doesn't mean you're the boss. I learned that the student's the boss and that you're a team, but you rob their dignity pretty fast by demoralizing them through statements that might make them feel less than. And when you do that, you shut down their learning. And so they, they don't come back. And so I never praise without truth. You, you, good, yeah. you, you can't praise people when they're, you, you always praise with truth and you always encourage because encouragement is important in a game that will beat you up. I mean, truly will, will beat you up. And we've all been there. You've been there as a player. I've been there as a mm-hmm. player. We know when we've been at the top and we know when it's just our game is in the tank. And so we know how they feel. And you can't ever lose that perspective. And, and sometimes as younger coaches are really good players, they can't fathom, how can you hit a shot like that? <laughs> right. You know, but someday you will. And some, someday your swing is going to fall apart. And you've got to have that humbling experience to put yourself in their, their shoes and to understand it's about maintaining their dignity and supporting them, but do it with truth and honesty and kindness. Yeah. Em- empathy is a big, is a yes. big word that I preach. You know, it's like having, cause it, like you said, golf is hard. And, uh, <laughs> you used to always say golf is fun, but I'm telling you what. <laughs> it golf, was a lie. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I would never every time, but when you do those uh, opening opening presentations for golf school, it's like, go golf's not hard; it's fun. And I'm like, you're full of shit. <laughs> but we all, we're all empathetic of how difficult the game is, you know. And I think that's a that's a great that's a great point. Um, you can't ever lose that fact. Yeah, you can't you can't have that ego to say, you know, what? <laughs> I can't believe you can't get the ball in the air. <laughs> what? I know. So, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting one. We'll, we'll always come back to that a little bit. Now, the the one thing, and this is, <laughs> and feel free to tell the embarrassing stories about me in this respect, <laughs> but you are one of the best, I think, public speakers and presenters that I've ever been around. And I've seen you speak a lot. And I know that didn't come by accident. I know you had coaching. I remember Ty Boyd was, was yeah. a big influence on you. Um, you sent me to Toastmasters because you, you told me how, how bad I could, I could tell how bad I was when I first started, but that was, and that's a story that I tell a lot when I first went to the golf school. I'm like, I had all these goals and I knew I was going to have to present in front of groups and I was terrified and I was, you know, and I tell everybody, everybody's awful at most things when you start out. Right. Talk a little bit about the importance of that. Cause I think it's huge. Uh, as a coach. And if you're going to be a top 100 teacher and you're going to have those kind of dreams, you better be able to present yourself in front of a group. Talk about your training and sort of your evolution of how you got to be such a great public speaker. Well, um, I took a public speaking course in college and they basically said, pretend everybody has a bag on their head. So uh, that never (laughs) really, never really connected with the audience. So Ty Boyd, uh, God rest his soul. He just died a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but, but he had a class called, um, uh, excellence in speaking Institute and every speech I give Ty Boyd is sitting on my shoulders and he is correcting me. And I am listening to him tell me to stand up straight eye contact and how important it is for vocal variety and pauses and, and practice. And so one of the things that he taught me, he says, if you're going to give a speech, you never get a, give a speech without um, a minimum of one to two rehearsals. So if I'm, I'm speaking at the PGA or the LPGA or to a business, um, I go over a, um, speech at night before I go to bed and I get up in the morning, take a shower and I put all my clothes and I do what's called a dress rehearsal and I get in front of a mirror and I go I was through gonna my say, whole do you speech. do it in a mirror? Yeah. yeah. That's, oh yeah. That's, that's oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Do it in front of a mirror and then I've gone through it. And so I know that I'm prepared. And so being prepared in, in a golf school setting um, because people are going to sum you up in the first five or six seconds. And you've got to really be powerful. You don't have to overdo it. You've just got to be sincere and you've got to be authentic. And you've got to let people know that you know what you're talking about without being over the top and pushing your way uh, uh, to, to make them really realize you're a great teacher. They will realize you're a great teacher just by your calmness and your demeanor and and what you have to say and how you say it. So uh, to me, public speaking, um, you know, that first interview I had with you, Jason, um, you know, I saw such a potential in you. And when you came to work, um, I wanted to um, I wanted to introduce you to everything because I saw it. And um, here you are. I mean, you know what? You, you got your start with with uh, our school. But you know what? You took it and you ran with it and you've done a phenomenal job. And I am so proud of you. And, you know, you couldn't you couldn't say three words in front of people. And now look <laughs> I at you. I mean, you've got thousands of people watching you all over the world. And yeah. and and that's uh, that's somebody who has been inspired and transpired by what's in your heart, what's in your soul to to, to push yourself to that next level. And you've done that. Thank you. That, that, that means a lot. And, you know, again, I remember so many conversations that we had, you know, just one-on-one that really inspired me. Cause I remember the first time we, we sort of got alone and, and this kind of goes with one of my uh, other topics is just yeah. leadership. And you, I mean, it's, you just asked me what I want, what, what yeah. do you want? What are your goals? And I said, I want to be a top 100 teacher. I want to be 
uh, respected by my peers and then I want to make a difference. And that's, and that's the first time anybody's asked me that. Right. Yeah. So I uh, used to, used to always just kind of throw me out there in front of a group and say, Hey, you know, I don't, <laughs> before I would even know what I was doing, like, Hey, talk about swing plane or do a chipping presentation or whatever. <laughs> so I mean, you know, sink or swim. Right. But that's the way, it, that's the way, it, but we did a lot of training. Yeah. I'll never forget, you know, the hardest presentations were like in front of our, our colleagues. These teachers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember doing a, uh, Julie would probably remember this very well doing a, just a club presentation, like going through a bag of clubs and I was throwing clubs all over the place and stumbling, <laughs> stepping on my tongue. And I was like, Oh my God, I've got to, that was probably one of those times where like, man, I got to get better. I, I'm in the wrong business. Yeah. Pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. But you recognized it and, and you did something about it. So obviously, you know, and that's, uh, we were very fortunate and, and so many young teachers, get in a situation where they're kind of the lone wolf and they're out there by themselves. And, you know, it's so important to have a network. And we were fortunate. We had eight or nine teachers and all of us Mm -hmm. really believed in the Dana Rader golf school brand and we all worked together. So if, um, you know, Nancy had a trouble with a student, she would come get myself or you or mm-hmm. Mark had trouble. Uh, Mark would never come and get me, but <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I love That's Mark. Right. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. You know, people on our team, our, 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 our team really were very, was very close um, together in, in, in helping each other. And so right. it was about the student, not about the ego of the teacher. And, and I, exactly. think I think, I think, I think, That's the thing that you have to lay down is be open minded, be teachable yourself as a teacher. Yeah. Iron sharpens iron is what I always remember you saying to me. And I've I've passed that on to my staff and people that ask me for advice. And, you know, we have to be as leaders. Right. We have to be just as open minded as as our as our mentees. Right. Um, I think that's a that's a very important thing that that you passed down. All right. So the next, the next point was uh, just your writing. And you mentioned that earlier is how to, how to write an instructional article and <laughs> tell me if I got this right. Cause this is what I remember you telling me. I may get it backwards. Cause I'd always, when I first started getting an opportunity to write for golf illustrated or whatever, I would always write it out and then I would bring it to you. I felt like the, have you ever seen the river runs through it, that movie, <laughs> right? I felt like I was bringing it to Tom Skerritt and you'd be like half as long, <laughs> half as long. <laughs> Cause I would always just go. So I was so wordy. You're like, tell them a lot about a little bit. That's right. Is that right? Or, exactly yeah. So that, right. that, that was the advice you always gave me. Tell so, them a lot so, about a little. Yeah. And it's, I think writing has kind of gone by the wayside, right? A little bit. Cause I mean, I started doing some blogging and you did that as well. And then yeah. now it's more towards videos, but yeah. I mean, writing I think is, is very underrated in, really the transformation of how we organize our minds. And I try to get our students to do, you know, do, do reflecting pieces with journals. And and you were a big, big uh, advocate of of journaling too, which I still do to this day. So talk a little bit about the importance of writing. Here's the, here's the studies on actually writing as opposed to uh, typing. Um, When you write, uh, you're actually imprinting your subconscious. So things go deeper into your mind when you're actually physically drawing as you're writing, so to speak. Um, so it imprints your subconscious. And if you look back, um, the goals that I've written uh, have come more to fruition than the ones that I've put on my laptop. So I've stopped writing goals on, on a laptop. So I stay handwritten. Uh, I still journal. Uh, I journal about things I've learned. I journal about my exercise. I journal about, um, you know, I keep a journal on my finances and, you know, my expenditures and, you know, why am I spending money like this? So it, it, it really imprints that subconscious mind so that it makes you more aware and it moves you closer to your goals. Yeah, that, that's that's perfect because that's I know there's been studies out there that talk about that. And I'm like, there, there's something to the exercise of actually writing with a pen yeah. or with a pencil as opposed to putting it in your phone or, like yeah. you said, typing it on a computer. So that's cool. Yeah, I know that was that was something that I definitely 
brought from you. Now the, the big thing, and this is this is a this is a, a great topic, is teaching beginners and women. Because I think this is you're one of the best, if not the best, in the country or the world at teaching beginners and women. When I came to the golf school, I was a so-so teacher. Now that I look back, I was probably I was really not that good, as good as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> the older we get, the less we really actually knew, right? So I know that looking back, but but I was reasonably good with good players because I probably couldn't screw them up as fast. <laughs> looking back, but what you really helped me with was just teaching. I taught so many women's beginner schools and um, and and men's one hundred and one schools. That really. I think helped my career more than anything. And you always used to tell us beginning golfers will teach you more than good golfers will ever Absolutely. teach you how to teach. Absolutely. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And I've got a couple of little points that, that I remember um, going through some of the little things you've taught me that I've that I still use today. <laughs> well, I think, I think a mistake uh, a lot of new teachers make is they, they don't want to teach new golfers. They don't want to teach necessarily women or, or juniors. Um, they, they, they prefer to teach lower handicappers and, um, you, you, you're going to miss instruction 110 fold. Uh, you're going to miss how to organize lessons. You're going to miss, you're going to miss things, uh, that a high handicapper is going to teach you about a low handicapper. And, um, when you really understand, how the wheel turns on a golf swing with with a brand new golfer, particularly a woman who lifts both heels up off the ground when they go back and their waist uh, stands straight up. Um, you really learn how to build a golf swing. And until you understand how to build it, it's very difficult to understand how to rebuild a, a golf swing, whether it be a someone who's a 14 wanting to get to single digits. So you can't rebuild if you don't know how to build. Yeah. The, one of the big things to teaching women and I, I, it gives me such credibility when I teach women at my club, because what's <laughs> the question they always ask? Like, what do I do with the girls? Right. Yeah. And I, I like, well, your arms don't go on the side and I always bring your name. <laughs> like Mr. Raider told me left arm goes on top. <laughs> and, and they're like, Oh my God, nobody's ever told me that. I'm like, trust me, I've done, so many golf schools with, with uh, <laughs> women just like you. And they're like, they, and they appreciate the fact that, that I kind of have that. that knowledge. And I, you know, I'm obviously, you know, I'm, I'm very clean about it, right, <laughs> but, <right. laughs> but I'm like, look, this is the way, you know, it, 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 it transforms them. Marking on gloves. That's something that I still do today with beginners. Yep. Yep. You showed me how to do that, which was great. And then the simple art of just putting somebody's hands on the club was yeah. is just amazing right i mean it's the, some of these little simple things like you said things we we can't do at this point with the with the coronavirus but yes. um but going back to your point of, about teaching beginners is it forces you to use language that anybody can understand yes right because you yeah. just always use the example of like okay if you tell a lady to pick the club up they're gonna pick the thing up straight up over the head <laughs> right i <laughs> well, mean they're gonna do exactly what you say and you're gonna learn how to refine your language a absolutely you know I i'll never forget uh my first lesson in 1980 which is a long time ago but um I, you know i gave i gave my first golf lesson i hadn't been a, a, a pro 15 minutes and um I go out on the tee and I said, you know, you're just picking the club up. And she goes, well, how else am I going to get it off the ground? <laughs> Great statement. I like, I mean, yeah, well, I know, never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, beginners will teach you how to use proper language and, and how to communicate. If you're mm -hmm. not working with them, you should. Yeah, Definitely. And then the, the second piece of that is is how to properly move people, which yes. I think is one of my sort of secret sauces now that I learned from you. I remember one time we were we were doing training or maybe like you were just watching me teach, because which was awesome. When you'd watch me teach, I'd be so nervous. And, you know, we'd always have a, a nice chat afterwards. And and you told me, he's like, Why are you are you trying to get them to take it outside? Like I was trying <laughs> to move them, move them, you know, and so that's something I've always carried along and, I, and then we start I started tran you know transforming the other coaches like Nancy and and learning how to teach that is an art I think almost a lost art in my opinion to be able to move people to get them to feel the wow. changes 
um, using a mirror as you move people that, that kind of helped me like, well, just do it in a mirror. Like, do it, you know, watch yourself yeah. in the mirror and make sure you're actually moving them in the direction that you want. Yeah. Um, and again, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting. I was teaching a couple of weeks before we got shut down and I couldn't do that. You know, almost like, oh my gosh, now I got to really use my language because yeah, <laughs> right. I can't get in there. I, get, I can't get in there and move people. But talk a little bit about that and the, and the importance of, you know, how you, how you use that skill and how did you learn that? I mean, who, who taught you that part of it? You know, it's, um, it's really understanding what it should look like with each person. You know, some people's got longer arms, some people shorter, shorter torso. But it's really, it's really helping them to understand what the plane should look like. What does it really mean when you take the club away and the, and the shaft's in front of you? What does that mm-hmm. mean? Because if you use that language, they'll have the club stuck 12 degrees outside, you know. So it's, it's, it's really uh, giving them uh, the feel, giving them some drills so they can relate to it, and then helping them move their body in space so that they can, they can get the feel for what they need to be doing. Because mm-hmm. in their mind, the way they want to swing a golf club is totally different than the way the golf club should be swung. And sure. so you have to do some hands-on manipulation to get them to feel that. And so I, 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 did, a, I did a lot of that. But I'm a very verbal teacher as well. Um, I talk them through it. I explain. I, you know, I, I, I really explain it in detail about what I want them to do without being talkative. But more importantly, to make sure they understand what I'm articulating to them, what I'm saying to them so that um, they've got a grasp of it from from a from a mindset. Then they can kind of put it together as I move them. Yeah, you've got a great uh, learning center there now at Belfair. Yes. Uh, I know I saw I was spending time with with Jason Um what technology are you using now that you maybe you had and you didn't use before and how are you adapting to that? Um, you know, um, I have learned probably more in the last couple of years using technology. I think I've become an even better teacher. Um, I think I've used the skills that I already have to get better. Uh, I use swing cat. And um, I use, um, um, obviously, uh, TrackMan. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's not only just beneficial for me as, as, a, as a teacher learner, but it's also great for the student. So you got somebody coming in who's, you know, eight degrees outside in, and you start making some changes with face and plane, and they see those numbers come down. They see their ball flight come in they they see the improvement. So I, I think technology um, has been a great benefit. And I've enjoyed it. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I, I do uh, Coach Now videos, um, you know, as, as a follow-up program for, mm-hmm. for, my, for my students. And uh, it keeps me in touch with them. And, um, you know, I, I'm never going to be one that's going to go overboard trying every swing aid in the, in the book. I believe my mind is the best part of, of what I do, but I also like to have, um, the, the, the other things that people need to have. Um, and, and, and I like, I, I quite honestly, I enjoy it. So it's been fun. That's awesome. Yeah. It's funny. Never how I, say I, that, did you? <laughs> I know. Right. Well, again, you don't know what you don't know is what we'd always say. And, right. and back when I first started at the golf school, I mean, we had V1 and we're hitting into a net. And we were considered like high tech, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Everybody's yeah. like, oh my God, the technology is amazing. They can draw lines and stuff. And like, now that's like archaic, right? So it would have been cool to have a launch monitor back in, back in the days, but you just have to evolve. Yeah. Anything that you've realized now using technology and just, or just any information that you've learned in the last say four or five years that you teach now that you didn't teach before? Oh, anything wow. you think of? Oh, swing cat. Um, the, using the ground, right? Oh, using the ground. Uh, yeah. cha- you can change somebody's swing shape uh, by using the ground um, for chipping and 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 chipping and p- or pitching. Uh, amazing uh, about uh, how much 
uh, pressure needs to stay on that left side and that left foot, and no pressure change up to about 50 yards. And, and just just how solid you hit the shot by, by maintaining mm-hmm. that left pressure uh, for a right-handed golfer. So that has been uh, very eye-opening f- for me, just really understanding. Because if you don't, if you're not aware of what you're doing with your feet, you're kind of swinging in the air. You, you, there's no resistance. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I wish I'd had that a long time ago <laughs> for yeah. me as a, as a player. <laughs> How about track man? Cause that, I mean, we, I think we understood the ball flight laws obviously, yeah. but it's kind of cool to have that measuring device to where, I mean, angle of attack, I think is difficult to, to see with the naked eye. It is. I mean, what, what have you found using track man? That's that you think has really helped you as far as just finding the, the solutions a little quicker. You, 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 you just can't, you can't see path. I mean, you just can't, yeah. I mean, you think you can, but you can't. And, um, you know, I had a guy today and, um, you know, he was four degrees left at impact um, outside, you know, and it was like, wow, that didn't look like that. But hey, yeah, on video, it maybe looks a little different, right? Video is the 2D and, you know, yeah. you got the 3D that tells you something totally different and how that club is swiping across that ball. And it, it you know, whereas, you know, I can correct that now. And um, it it has helped me a lot more understand how incredible this swing that we all make is and how, how much we have to still learn about it. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I still want to keep learning and I'm, I'm I'm having the time of my life uh, with this technology and, you know, and I think to the real critical point for all these new teachers is the greatest compliment you can ever get from your players is not I'm hitting it better, is I'm playing better. I've lowered my scores. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting it around the golf course. My ball controls better. Um, I've lowered my handicap four strokes. I've lowered my handicap two strokes. Uh, I, I'm having more fun at the game. That that's that's what we do. That's our job. How much are you uh, able to spend on the course now with your students being right in a now, club like that? Yeah, right. We, usually, I mean, like uh, prior prior to coronavirus <laughs> shutdown. Prior, but. Yeah, prior to the virus, uh, all gosh, I was I probably did four or five playing lessons a week. Nice. So, any, uh, any games that you like to to play with your students, or any anything I, you like to do to to kind of get the scoring challenges up a little bit. One of the things that, that I like to do is I like to caddy for them. I like to say, I'm your caddy. I'm not your coach today. And um, I like to, I like to walk them through, help them with the aim, help them with club selection, teach them some shots, really work on side hill, downhill lies. So many people, you know, in our course is very undulating and so I really like to get them comfortable on the golf course. And, and, you know, lower handicappers don't have as difficult time as higher handicappers do is getting them a little more comfortable, getting them into a good, a good routine where they, where they have good priorities and how they approach the golf ball and they have a good process. But, um, you know, and, and then I'll take them from 50 yards and in, or I'll take them from 20 yards and in. I'll do kind of an Operation 36 for three or four or five holes just to get them in a scoring mentality. So mm-hmm. playing lessons are, are, I think, vital. And, you know, since we've been, we're not closed. Our course is still open, but we, yeah. we're not allowed to go out and do playing lessons just right now. So, um, and I've, you know, but playing lessons are absolutely essential. Yeah, for sure. So, Speaking of the young coaches, like what, what, there's two ways to answer, to ask this question is like, what advice do you give to young coaches? But I like to say, what advice would you give to your 25 year old self just getting into to the game or getting into teaching and, and wanting to get better as an instructor? What would you tell them? Oh, I would, I would tell them that you need to surround yourself with other teachers. Uh, you need to be in a network. Uh, you know, now we have the great fortune of, of doing it, you know, through the internet, but, um, you know, being able to teach with other teachers 
and measure yourself a little bit um, as a teacher is very important. And to get feedback, have other teachers watch you teach and be open to uh, constructive criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, be, don't protect yourself. Don't protect your ego and, and really want to get better. And um, so, you, you know, you need to make sure you've got a network of people that uh, you can go and teach with or they can watch you teach um, and, and, and not just online, but in person where those are those those personal uh, connections and relationships uh, help mold you. Yeah, I, I, I tell the story all the time because we had to go actually go watch people teach and, and, and guys are doing a better job of that nowadays. But it's easy to, to pull somebody up online. I mean, you can see what I'm teaching or see what you're teaching on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. is actually spending time with that person, asking them questions, you know, there's, getting, no, getting, there's no personal connection between you and yeah, that person. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's really, that's great advice. And, you know, one of the things that you instilled in me for sure was the importance of education and, and being that continuous learner. Um, I think you inspired me to start reading a mm-hmm. lot more than I ever did. We had book club, right? Yep. Yep. We used to do book club for training, which was fantastic. And, trying to get some of the young guys nowadays is like, they don't read as much, which is fine. Like I said, the, the, everything's changed. You can still get the information different ways, but what, um, what are some of your favorite books over the years? Cause I, I, I hate to run on, but it's just, just I had this opportunity. Um, <laughs> you always, <laughs> cause I just, again, I told you I would think up stuff that, on the, on the fly here, but when we used to have young ladies from the LPGA would come and watch you teach. And you would always send them after they watch you give a few lessons. You'd say, go watch Jason teach and then go ask him how many books he's read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> People don't understand. And then they <laughs> said, then you always said, ask him how many books that non-related golf books he's read. Like, so that was some of the things that, that you really pushed on me was go read other coaching books, go read marketing books, go read leadership books, you know? Mm-hmm. So tell, tell me a little bit about the importance of how that, I mean, that's super important, but sort of your evolution, and then give us a co- couple of your favorites. Well, I've you always uh, listened to motivational tapes. Gosh, by the time I was just out of college, um, starting my career, uh, a lot of Zig Ziglar stuff. Um, yes. <laughs> Norman Vincent Peale. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of motivational things, because I think it, if you read a golf book, you're you're reading the analogies of you know how you shape a golf swing. You're reading everybody's opinion on on what you do for a living. When you read a leadership book or a motivational or a self help book, you're able to delve into yourself and go, "Am I that person? Do I want to be that person? How can I be the better part of me? How how can I be a better me?" And it starts exposing some of the things that, oh, I don't do that. Well, I do that, but I don't do that too, you know, too much. And so it's, it's, you know, it's the old saying, all, all um, leaders are, are readers. And, and, and leaders uh, read a lot of books. And mm-hmm. as golf professionals, we're leaders, we're leaders in our industry. We're leading people every day. So you need a lot of tools that uh, you can talk to people on different fronts so that you're not just uh, one minded into just the golf swings. The only thing you're reading. And I'll never forget. I told one of the guys that worked for me there um, at the school. <laughs> I'll never forget. I said, I want you to read some leadership books. And he goes, what's that got to do with golf? I never oh, did get him. To, yeah. I never did get to re- get him to uh, get to understand that. But you know, that yeah. was just his mindset, and that's where he was. And and you know, but we all we all need to have learning outside our sphere and, and outside our what we're learning in in golf. We need to to learn about leadership. We need to learn about management, and business, and novels. I mean, oh, I'm reading tons of novels now, and I mean, yeah. just I mean, I just. Uh, I love to read. So um, if you don't like to read, read a page and then tomorrow yeah. night, read another page and just get into habit of reading a little bit at a time. And yeah. next thing you know, you'll finish the book. That's yeah. And that's funny. You say Zig Ziglar. I actually just listened to another program this morning. You got me on that. We talked about it and I became obsessed with 
audio programs. I call it audio yeah. audio bill, um, automobile uh, university, which is what Zig calls it. <laughs> and I listened to, I remember listening to at least an hour, like for like three or four years straight of Jim Rohn. And I talk about him all the time on this program, but I forgot that you were into Zig and like, yeah. see, there, there it is. There's another thing that you like, I mean, we, it's amazing. And you can still do that. Now it's podcasts, you know, yeah. really it's kind of evolved in the podcast. That's why I listen to a lot of podcasts with the same thing. Yeah. You, as long as you're putting information into your head on a daily basis, it's going to push you towards your goals or make you a better person. Like you said, make you a better version of yourself. Yeah. I just think it's, it's so valuable. You're missing out on an opportunity to learn something. Yeah. Read Jim Rohn, read go ahead. Sorry. No, well, reading gives you wisdom. Yes. And, and, it, and it gives you the ability to think through things that it gives you that ammunition and it, it, it opens your mind and, and makes you more multiversal rather than just one dimensional. Yeah. Jim Rohn used to always say there's no there's no accident. The fact that every house over two thousand two hundred thousand dollars has a library. <laughs> It's like, I always, I always share that with people. It's like, you know, your vocabulary is your, is your IQ. Yeah. Right. And like you said, and it's, so, so what do you, what do you, uh, I know you just talked about some nonfiction stuff, but like t- talk about a couple of your favorite books that you'd recommend. Um, I, I just Anything finished, think of? I, I just finished a book, um, uh, called Atomic Habits. I heard uh, of that one. Yeah. Uh, great book. I'll get, his name is James clear and phenomenal book. Um, I would say to read that book and do what it says. Um, It talks just about how you establish habits. So we establish bad habits exactly the same way we establish good habits. Mm -hmm. And um, so great book. Uh, Another one is slight edge. Um, I would say we read that. Yeah. Just, just a terrific book. Um, and, and I read a, a lot of books on public speaking. I still, uh, I have, um, can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head, but I have a book that uh, that I go back to and read before I do speeches. And it's just I do too. subtle reminders of things. And I go back and read my highlights. Um, but um, this this uh, Atomic Habits is probably one of my one of my one of my favorite picks, and, and of course the Slight Edge. Yeah, Presentations Plus is a book that I kept going back to. I don't know if you yep. recommended that to me because yep. I've had it. I think I got it when I was at the golf school. Yeah, um, David Peoples, I think, was the is the author. But um, God, we read so many good books. I mean, John Maxwell books, you know that we that we used to read. Servant, oh, yeah. the Servant Leader book, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, there was just so many, and none of them had to do with golf, which was fantastic. I think it just yeah, made us more well-rounded. It did, and and it, um, I don't know what it does. It just sharpens your mind and takes you into a, a a new way of thinking, a better way of thinking, and it makes you, uh, you know, if a if a golf instructor gets up in the morning, or a businessman or woman, and they walk out of their house and they don't make their bed. And they don't do the little things. And that's what this slight edge is, is about. And they're, they're not writing thank you notes or they're not taking the time to do little things that are little touches that mean a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, what, that's what builds a person into, a, into a, having a stronger character. Um, you know, it's, it's just those little things that, that go a long, long way. And, you know, there, there's a whole book written on make your bed and it was written by uh, a general. And I was going to say, it's probably either a Navy SEAL or an yep, yep. army yeah, person. I, yeah, I don't it's know great. Name, but, but it's yeah. the name of the book is make your bed. And that's what you start with. My daddy taught me that as a little girl. He said, look, you know, me and your mother are not going to come in here and make this bed up every day. You get your foot out of the bed. And you turn around, you make your bed and you've started your day off with success. And, yeah. and that's uh, done at least uh, one thing, right? That's right. You, what, <laughs> you've done something that you've, you've been productive and you hadn't even gone to have breakfast yet. Right. That's right. <laughs> it's all, it's all about momentum. Right. When people right. ask me, he's like, oh, how do you, you know, when I was doing all the running stuff, it's like, how do you do that? Well, you got to run one mile before you can run 26. That's right. And it's just, it's about, it's about creating those daily habits and, and just one step at a time. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think for the teachers out there um, that are in their 20s and early 30s and whatnot that are really trying to get their career going, you you look at someone like Jason who who has done great things. Well, he didn't roll out of bed like that. And he didn't just wake up one day and say, you know, next week I want to be this. And so uh, that's why I recommend the Atomic habit, Habits, because it is little steps. It is a little bit at a time doing the right things over a period of time, over and over and over, that start to shape you as a human being and shape you as a teacher. Um, and, and being patient with it and trying not to be a great teacher today, but waiting for tomorrow. Yeah, that's the EQ stuff. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're the best. I mean, this is so good. I'm telling you. So, so what, it, looking back on your career or just even looking back, you know, through the golf school, would you change anything? Oh gosh. Yeah. I, I would change. A, I would, I would change a lot. Um, um, just from a, a structure of, uh, the building I would, I would have changed. But we didn't know. I mean, you know, back right. then there were about three buildings in the country. So that's right. Yeah, know, it was brand so, new. Yeah, the internet had just it wasn't even online yet. Um, you know, I I would probably have stayed a little smaller, and um, I got too big, um, and the brand actually got b- bigger than me. I mean, I'll never forget mm-hmm. one day uh, we had uh, twenty. Um, young uh, bankers in and there was about um, a mix of handicaps and uh, I walked into the group and it was a corporate group and I walked into the group and said hi I'm Dana Rader and the guy looked at me and he goes so there 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 is a Dana Rader I'm going (laughs) yeah that's me and he goes oh and they all looked at me and went okay the brand has become bigger than me which is which works but it, it's uh, it was a strange feeling that wow I've kind of lost myself in my own name, and yeah. and, and and I would have probably stayed smaller and um, probably um, done some different things from a business standpoint in, in terms of the the model that was in place, but the model was was a pioneer model. Um, you know, right. it's very hard to find a lot of ways to, to, to run a golf school because there wasn't a lot of people doing that at that level. Yeah, so like us and Jim McLean were about yeah, the yeah. biggest at the time. Yeah, it was, and, it was, it was tough to, to, to get information and a lot of people just didn't have the information. So sure. there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, but in terms of the, of the instructors and the lives that um, we touched, oh, I wouldn't, I, no, I wouldn't change that for anything. That yeah, was, what was worth it all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seemed uh, definitely late in, I guess, late to 2000s, you know, when we were getting big and so busy, it was taking you farther and farther away from what you loved, which was coaching. You know, it's Mm -hmm. you're having to do more of the business side. I could see that Mm -hmm. kind of struggle that you were having. Yeah, it was uh, it was really it was really difficult. And then then, you know, I I was president of the LPGA for six years and that took me all all over the world and. Um, which was a lot of fun as, as well. Uh, I have no regrets because that was great six years too. But you you tended I tended to get too far away from what was my passion. Now now I'm back at it again. The director yeah. instruction there at Belfair, and, and I'm having a blast. Yeah, you, you definitely seem seem happy and at, at, at peace. Yeah, so at so peace. yeah. What what does success mean to you? How would you describe it? Oh, wow. That's now that's a hard question. Um, you know, success is not, um, you know, success is not money and success is not titles and it's not accolades. Um, I think it's what you do every day and how well you do it. You know, it's it, you know, too many of us think success are plaques on the wall and money in the bank. And, and I can tell you, I got a, I, I got a, attic full of and that doesn't bring it and it's nice yeah you do <laughs> it's, it, it, it's nice but i can tell you that um the the, the 19 handicapper that dropped his stroke three times or, or his handicapped three points that that that's that's why you do it i mean that's you, you don't need anything other than 
your students' satisfaction. And, and if you really have that mindset, you'll go a long way. Yeah, definitely. Like what, what keeps you passionate and what keeps you going? I think you probably just answered it, but is there, is there something else that, you know, that you um, maybe found in your new sort of second career now, I guess (laughs) that, uh, right. That you're going to get back to the, to your, to your roots. Like what, uh, what gets you out of bed in the morning? You know, um, here's, here's my answer. Um, really simple. I just don't have anything to prove. I'm just not trying to prove anything. I'm not trying to be the best anymore. I, I, and it's not, I'm, it's not that I'm saying I've arrived. It is saying that I wish I'd had that mindset a little bit earlier that I, you know, because you drive yourself so hard that sometimes you can resent what you do and you can also resent the love you have and Mm -hmm. for the game. And so when you kind of step back away from everything and said, you know what, Dana, you've had a great career. So now this is about continuing my career, but um, I, I, I want everything simpler. I want to, I want to have more fun in my job. And I absolutely get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and I get a rush in my, in my stomach. I can't wait to get to work. That's awesome. I mean, I can't wait to get to work. And so it's, it's, it's kind of cool. So it's really just, you know, it, you know, it's really not reinventing my career. It, it really isn't that. And it's really just saying, I really love to teach and I've gone back to what I really love to do. There you go. Very well said. Yeah. So, so when you feel, and you may not ever get there now being, being in paradise down there at Hilton Head Island, but when you feel unfocused or overwhelmed, what do you do? What are some tips or tactics or go-tos? You know, um, when I feel, particularly when I was running a golf school, uh, when I, when I feel overwhelmed, I would sit down and I would take a notebook and I'd say, all right, get it all out of your head everything's got to go on paper. What is it that you've got to do? Don't go to bed until it all get, cause I'm not going to wrestle with it all night. And then I would literally just dump it out of my head on paper and I'd go, Oh, that's not so bad because our mind twists things around and, and makes it bigger than it is. And once I would write it down and I'd look at it and going, okay, I can deal with it. And then I'd go right to sleep. The worry it, factor is a big yeah, deal. In it, it is. It is. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you're responsible for things, uh, you tend to worry. And I'm a worrier. I mean, I'll be honest. I, I worry. I'm right there with you. Yeah, yeah. I worry about everybody. Yeah. And and so, um, you know, it's just getting things out of your head and uh, prayer. Uh, you know. I was going to say, yeah, that, that was uh, the, the last thing I was going to close with was, you know, sharing your faith. Yes. And how that influenced yeah. me and my and my walk with with Christ is yes. still ongoing. And I can't thank you enough for that. You were so encouraging. And that was well, that was that changed my life. I, I'll, I'll tell you, when, when you when you got when you when you got Christ on your shoulder and, and, and you've 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 got a a life that um, is pleasing to him and um, you're at peace. Um, it, it makes everything better. And, you know, moving down here, I left my church in Charlotte, which was really hard, very sure. tough to find another church. So I think I've, I think I've found another church now, now that I've found it, <laughs> I can't go. But <laughs> right. <laughs> so this Online. Goes away. <laughs> Virtual. But, uh, yeah. But I, <laughs> but I can, t- yeah, it's not the same, but it, it is a great message. But um, that was a, a profound time in my life. And, um, so, you know, faith holds us all together and, um, is, is the beacon that shows the way. Yeah. And you, I mean, you were the onlooker of sort of my transformation. And I remember several times where you looked at me and go, you're different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And that was so cool. Yeah. I'm so proud a lot of, of talks. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much for your time. We've got, we've got to do one more question. Everybody's got okay. to answer this one is if you had to get a message to billions of people, basically a message to the world and put it on a gigantic billboard, 
what would your message be and why? Love one another. Because love, the Bible says, love conquers a multitude of sins. And if we had that, this world would be a lot better place. Amen. Yep. Such a great way to close. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to give out your uh, your I know you're not big on social media. You kind of Oh gosh. But I you don't, can, <laughs> Social what? <laughs> that's right. But anything you want to plug or anything that I haven't asked you uh before we close. This has been fantastic and thank you so much for for doing no, this. You know, I I I don't, you know, I I do Facebook a little bit. <laughs> But no, I, I'm really not. And probably will. You know me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jason, I'm probably not going like to do that. Give, I give, yeah. All right. <laughs> you, like, you like to give me a hard time, but. Um, That's all right. Yeah. But no, not me. I, I had a hard enough time getting on this. <laughs> getting it all hooked up. <laughs> well, like I said, I saved the, the hundredth episode for you because you've been such a oh. special person in my life. Well, and thank, I can't you. thank you. That's, enough. that's, that's, that's special for me. I appreciate it. And I love you. I love you too, big girl. Okay. All right. Have a good evening. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. Uh, First, big thank you to Dana for coming on the show and, and sharing her story and her knowledge and insights of the game. And it was not just an awesome conversation for me, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again to our sponsors, EnviedHemp.com and swing you so make sure you use that promo code guru20 uh, when you log on to envidhip.com and go buy your cbd and then go download my app Uh, this is a great time to start doing online lessons and get in there and there's some great information i'm putting out videos and content every day on the social feed so go check that out Uh, follow me and reach me on twitter or instagram at golf guru tv So let's get those followers up. I appreciate everybody that that started following as of late. Hope you're enjoying the content and keeping up with everything that I'm doing. Uh, Also, check out my website at golfgurutv.net where you can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. And I'm going to start putting some more stuff on the website here shortly. Uh, If you have a question or a comment, you can also email me at the show, golfgurushow at gmail.com. Or just hit me up on the DM, which is what most of you do. And I appreciate all the DMs. Uh, Be patient. I'm trying to get back to everybody. Uh, This show and all episodes of the Golf Guru Show are produced by myself, Jason Sutton. Uh, Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And leave me an iTunes review. That would be cool. Give me a five-star rating. That would be awesome. And as I leave you with RIP Mr. Jim Rohn, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much for listening.